Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Sterning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in Kansas. People who aren't from the Plains tend to have a number of fairly serious misapprehensions about Kansas. When I first met my husband, he held a pulpit in Wichita, so I was down there a lot visiting him, and I've spent time in the state in all seasons. The special beauty of the Flint Hills in spring is impossible to capture in a photograph. Kansas it can feel like the cleanest place there is. In Wichita, I was consistently impressed by the area's strong interfaith community and the generosity and community giving. In Kansas, I have met many people who truly live their values. But of course, that doesn't take away from the fact that Kansas has really tough baseline climate conditions. Even people who don't know anything about the state beyond what they learned in The Wizard of Oz are aware of the tornadoes. And this is another one of those plain states, of course, that gets big storms, big heat, and deep cold. So let's check out the climate outlook for Kansas as we move towards 2C. I hope we'll find some edges to hold in this beautiful state, and I'll do my best to tell you clearly if the projections look bad. Before we get going, though, I want to show you how I set the table, show you the resources I'm going to use so that you can access them and judge their quality for yourself. If you go to my website, AmericanResiliency.org, and go to the Resources tab, You'll find everything that I use to make my forecasts, including my original visualizations and our important source information, the publicly available data and figures from the NCA5. When we're talking about climate, I think it's also important that we all have an opportunity to get on the same page. We're not where we expected to be in terms of Earth system conditions. When I started American Resiliency, I often talked about 2050 outlooks because we thought we'd be a 2C by about 2050. But something really went wrong towards the end of 2023. You can see here with these monthly bullet points from the Copernicus Institute that our raw surface temperature anomaly has stabilized at about 1.5 C over pre-industrial baseline. Climate scientists don't really know what's going on with this unusual and stable anomaly. But it means that now, more than ever, it's entirely reasonable to be concerned about what your home may look and feel like as we get closer to 2C. It's very reasonable to be thinking about how your home will change by 2C, and I want you to be able to do your own research and confirm everything I report without too much work on your end. At American Resiliency, we use the fifth National Climate Assessment data and figures because they represent the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of this information, and you deserve meaningful access to it. Here in the U.S., we have better, more detailed climate projections than are available almost anywhere else on Earth. And it's because you paid for it already. But as a matter of congressional mandate, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about the National Climate Assessment. That's why I founded American Resiliency. We're the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the general public, and we run on your donations. Let's look at the heat first. I'm here checking out the AR wet bulb risk tool. This lets us see if the risk of killing heat, potentially dangerous heat, is increasing between where we are now at 1.5 C. And I know this 1.5 C summer we just experienced has been a hot one for many of us in 2 C, where we're going here. And we see some range across the state. If you look over on the border here by Missouri, by Kansas City, this summer, you probably had about three weeks of potentially dangerous heat. It looks like you're going to be going to four by 2C. But if you look a little bit further west, including Sedgwick County, where we find Wichita, we see larger dangerous heat increases are expected with an additional two weeks of potentially fatal temperatures as we approach 2C. And I want to understand that better because in the risk tool here, we're seeing the potential for danger. But I think the Kansas is used to a little heat and you really want to understand the edges. Let's get some more details for how much of that additional heat is projected over 105 because I actually do think you can handle it if it stays below 105 as it's fairly arid in most of Kansas. And in my time in Kansas, I've seen there's a lot of solid, thick-walled construction there. I think a lot of your existing housing stock is pretty well insulated in a way that could be useful as we get ready for increasingly extreme conditions. For that fine-grained 105 plus information, I've gone directly into the NCA 5's Climate Atlas to zero in on projected days over 105. Here we've got county level information available for every state in the nation. And if you click on it, 
it'll take a while to load. I can't just pan over and get you the information like I can with the AR tool. So let me read you what I've studied off of this figure, which is looking rather dreadful as we head west of Wichita. In Wichita, as you saw, we're looking at nine additional days of heat over 105 projected, which is quite unpleasant. Over towards Kansas City Metro, we're looking at more like three additional days over 105. Shawnee County with Topeka, you're looking at about 40 additional days over 95. And of those, four are projected over 105. And our friends in Douglas County, Kansas, you're looking at a slightly milder total hot season increase of 36 days over 95. Three of those additional days are projected over 105. Those are concerning temperatures, and it can get pretty humid as you get closer to Missouri. 105 and humid, that's the kind of conditions that would likely be harmful to healthy young people. It's very important that people be able to cool down at night if they're going to endure heat like we're projecting here during the day. On the border by Oklahoma especially, those are enormous high-end heat increases in the projections with nearly two weeks of additional heat over 105 projected. So let's look at that nighttime heat and see if you're going to get any relief. For that, I go to figure 2.11 from the NCA5 and I zoom in here on warm night information. You can see here there is a climb across the state where as you go west, it will cool down better at night. And this is difficult to see, though, because we are projecting about a month in that red area of additional nights over 70. That will be challenging in terms of ag impacts. There's a lot of overlay in your productive ag land and your additional nights over 70. These are conditions that will absolutely reduce yields on conventional staple crops. Kansas, this information coming together means you absolutely need to be strategizing about how to provide resilient cooling to yourself and your household if you want to stay in Kansas as we approach 2C. Nighttime cooling especially is very important as you think about how to get through a regular two-week period in some parts of the state over 105. But in an arid environment, there are ancient passive solutions to these problems in case the power goes out we have solutions available there are power free solutions that people have been using for millennia from out of the middle east to stay cool in extreme temperatures there's a need to respond to change with this kind of heat but there are also solutions kansas we need to know though if you're going to get water let's look at that now I'm going to start to peek at that in figure 210 of the NCA5, zooming in on our 2C projection. You can see that there's an intensification of the existing precipitation climb in Kansas with a drought trend emerging towards the southwest and more precipitation projected, particularly here in this northeast corner. But, you know, I just researched Oklahoma last week and there was a big difference between precipitation models for Oklahoma. I Let's check that out for Kansas. Let's look at another model. Now I'm zooming in at 4.3. And this, oh, this is better looking for Kansas than it was for Oklahoma. You're looking to get consistent modeling for increased precipitation, particularly in this northeast corner with your more severe drought trend looking confined in both models to the southwest. So that's some good news. So I want to point out that in eastern Kansas and northeast Kansas, we're looking at smaller heat increases than the rest of the state, and we're looking at getting a little bit more precipitation. Those are potential good signs for some hope of landscape stability in that northeast corner. Before we talk more about landscape, though, I want to check you for extreme storm signals. So in this very complex figure here, figure 2.12, what I do is I look for repeating patterns across the sub figures, and I am seeing moderately intense signals for increased severe storms appearing in northeast Kansas, meaning that we've got challenges as well as blessings coming with that additional rain. Your signals aren't as intense as I'm seeing over here in Missouri. Check out this spot. One, two, three. That's an intense repeating spot. But you can see there's sort of more of a sporadic clustering for Kansas. Nothing really dark here, pretty dark here, fairly dark here. So it's like a little higher than the national average, not one of the like distinct freaky outy trouble spots like we see right here on the edge of Lake Michigan, one, two, three, right? I would be concerned, but not super concerned. I want to point also that, you know, Southwest Kansas was looking real deserty and the other factors that we examined, but they are also looking at an eye in the storm. 
look at the light color appearing on the map here. One, two, three. Along with the very edge of the Oklahoma panhandle, southwest Kansas looks to be potentially picking up kind of a New Mexico flavor in these projections, which is potentially a good thing across many factors if you like that kind of desert feeling. And I feel like it is worth noting that if you are freaked out by these extreme storms that we've been seeing in the U.S., you want to look for repeating yellow on figure 2.12 and the projected conditions they're not great, but they're substantially more survivable in this repeating yellow area than in these ones. Really, really hot looking by Southern California and Arizona. But let's get back to talking about landscape. You know, if we're talking about developing similarities to New Mexico, I imagine you perceive we could well be seeing projected landscape change in parts of Kansas. In Western Kansas, where we've got big heat increases and a drought trend, we are looking at a trend towards aridity, and that could lead to the emergence of dust bowl conditions. Keeping the soil covered through the transition will help us avoid dust bowl conditions. I know many people in Kansas share family memories of the dust bowl like my family does. If you don't have access personally to that well of memory, I would recommend you watch my video on what that was, what the dust bowl was for us on the plains, and where we are at risk for emerging dust bowl conditions across the U.S. at 2C. A link to that video is in the video description. Over on the eastern side of Kansas, we have a good ground report from an AR community member in Lawrence, Kansas. She's reporting pretty substantial tree death, and I will say throughout the region, we're getting tree death in Iowa too. The tree death is a regional problem because in our region, trees are getting hit right now by a combination of factors. The elm trees are getting hit by those beetles just now in our part of the world. The big 2020 derecho was four years ago. It takes some years for trees to die after experiencing severe wind stress. They'll hold on for a while, but some of our tree deaths right now are related to that big straight line windstorm. Also, it's worth noting our region went through a very severe drought last year. When I talk about the potential for landscape stability that I'm seeing so far in eastern Kansas, I'm not trying to sugarcoat the changes we're already experiencing. I'm saying, don't call it yet. We don't need to give up hope yet. Let's look at another factor that's of particular interest for trees and how landscapes will change in general, winter change. So I'm back in figure 2.11 here, zooming in on cold days, looking at our loss of cold days. You can see that in Kansas, this looks pretty straightforward with a 15 to 20 day loss of cold projected across the state. Let's look at cold intensity now. I do that in figure 11.3, looking at projected changes in plant hardiness zones, which you can see is unusably gigantic. I'm just showing it to you. And now we're gonna go to a side-by-side -side snip for just Kansas. So this is a winter change very like what we're expecting for Missouri. You're gonna be shifting towards lows above zero rather than lows below zero. So it'll still be freezing in the winter, but there'll be a real difference in the plants you can overwinter with that change. And we do expect a fair amount of landscape change on account of that. This is a state where the landscape is really calling out for prairie restoration across a broad portion of the state. And we know prairie gets carbon into the ground, below the ground where it can't burn up in a wildfire. Kansas was prairie country and we need the prairie back in every part of the land that can hold it if we wanna pull down carbon. In western Kansas, the drought trend looks like it might be moving out of grasslands into desert as the landscape changes. A lot of the state is looking at a 10 degree shift. I want to direct your attention here, right here in this area that is light yellow, but is below what was medium blue. This area here, right about encompassing Topeka, is where you've got best potential for landscape stability for mature plants and trees because you're only talking about a five degree lift in winter lows. You're also gonna be getting potentially adequate water and mild enough summer change for trees to survive. That is your lowest change populated area in Kansas right there. I've mentioned fire and the fire map in the NCA5 is figure 7.4, but I'm gonna use this modified version that volunteer and community member Ashley Q made because I think that having the state outlines on that makes it much less brain hurdy. I think it's important that we see the risk of fire danger 
is aligned with the picture we're putting together so far in the projections. So where we've got trees in Kansas is mostly on the eastern edge of the state here. And you can see that the fire danger is a little bit higher, that the figure is a little bit darker. As you get to sort of the southern two-thirds of that eastern edge, it's not so bad as you get north. And then you've got this sweet spot by Topeka where it looks relatively low, relatively little increase in fire danger. Kansas, there are quite a few ways that this shift, all of these factors together as we think about 2C, would have you looking a lot more like Texas used to in the summer and a lot more like Oklahoma used to in the winter. We're talking about big swings with a bigger summer change than a winter change. For a lot of the state, we're talking about a 40-day plus hot season increase and a 20-day cold season decrease. I am heartened that you're not projected to pick up as much of a drought trend as we see south of you, but I don't know that you're getting enough more rain to do much more than somewhat offset that long, serious hot season. These are challenging conditions with big swings. Northeast Kansas, Topeka, and east of Topeka, I think that you've got potential and you're in adaptation range, but it looks hard. Wichita, I would be more freaked out on your behalf if I didn't know you. The heat increase you're facing is gnarly. You would need some serious adaptation measures to develop both passive and active cooling strategies throughout Wichita. But those are problems that could be solved with money. And I know Wichita's got it. There are some very wealthy families in Wichita, and in my experience, many of them are very civic-minded, supporting meaningful, positive change in the community through generous philanthropy. But let's get serious. It's not just about giving. It's also about Wichita's potential, because these are conditions where the right investments could pay off and create a desirable hot summer city for people inclined to leave Arizona and Southern California due to the incredibly challenging projections there. Wichita could be a resilient city with a fabulous perimeter. I would not say that every city could adapt to these conditions, but Wichita might have the resources it would take. The agricultural outlook for Kansas is not good in the western half of the state. I think the eastern half, you're still getting enough rain to have some potential, but there may be a need to continue to shift towards shoulder season growing, and I know that transition and continued experimentation with changing crops are already very active ag innovation areas in Kansas today. Kansas, I hope this outlook to help you understand the challenges you're likely to experience as we move towards 2C, and I'm wishing you all the best. When we look to our values, to our role on earth, I know many people in Kansas live their values as stewards, as caretakers of the earth. When we look to Kansas as a place of powerful faith, I think it's important to recognize there's a real tension today between stewardship and dominion. I think it's important to recognize that many people of faith in Kansas, many congregations in Kansas have power and influence that could create a generational future in Kansas. Speaking to that audience for a moment, in the Bible, we do see much given to humanity for our use, and we see also many parables about what appropriate use is. When you give your teenager a car for their use, if they smash it up irresponsibly, are you really inclined to give them a new one? For those of us who believe our actions are seen and judged, the call to stewardship feels powerful at this time. And to me at least, the call that we will be given a new world sounds as hollow and spoiled as something that might come out of the mouth of the most irresponsible and undisciplined child. Back to the science as we close out. I think that if you're in Eastern Kansas, you could stay in your home, but that hot season increase, it does look very serious. You'll wanna build both passive and active heat resilience. You want a toolbox of solutions for extreme conditions like those. I would strongly recommend solutions that will work when the power goes out, especially because we do see some signs of problematic increasing extreme storm signals in that area. And you all know, the storms of the plains can already be very intense. If you're digging in, it's time to take action and respond to the challenge of this future. Let's get ready. Hey folks, thanks for watching. I wanna take a moment to say thank you to the AR community, to the donors, to the volunteers, to everyone spreading the word online, and especially to everyone doing the work in your households and on the ground. 
It's thanks to all of you that I can keep doing this work, and I'm so grateful for your support. I'm glad to be getting ready with you, and I look forward to talking with you all again soon.